is on the walk over here, but I haven't come back yet and related our sympathetic fibers to the contractile cells. The vagus nerve has some receptors for its acetylcholine on the atrial cell, but not on the contractile cell. All right, so there can be some increase in atrial contraction, but we're not going to see a significant amount affected in the heart or blood pressure because the atria really are just squeezing a little bit at the end. Most of the blood flow into the ventricle, as we'll see on Thursday, is just pressure that flows through the atria and continues on into the ventricle. Lots of pressure is pushing it in there, created by the ventricles at the beginning. And we don't really need the atrial contraction to empty the atria. Blood sort of flows through during the ventricular filling. However, our ventricular contractile cells do have receptors for norepinephrine. Right. So remember that slide I showed you previously from our endocrine system? Anyway, remember it down the increased calcium channels intracellularly as well as extracellularly? So when we do that to our ventricular contractile cells, What's the role of calcium in muscle cells? What does calcium do once it's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum? It initiates the... It takes... Oh, the it binds to... Instead of chromodulin, it binds to... Troponin. Troponin and calcium separate from the actin filament. And tropomyosin now has the ability to move deeper into that groove created by the twisting actin uh, filaments, and that exposes the binding site for myosin heads, which initiates the sliding force created by myosin as it cocks those heads and swings them towards each other. All right, so with more calcium, we have more binding sites on actin for myosin. So not only does norepinephrine binding to the autorhythmic cells increase the heart rate by allowing more calcium in to reach threshold earlier, in the, in the contractile cells it allows more calcium in and that provides a greater force of contraction because more actin sites are available. So we have not just an increased rate but an increased force, a greater volume ejected from the heart with each particular contraction. And we'll look at that when we look at cardiac output and blood pressure regulation. All right, so with a stronger contraction, more volume, greater pressure. So which of these do you think is more important in regulating blood pressure? Vagus or cardiac accelerator nerves? You're right, cardiac accelerator nerves. All right, because not only can we lower heart rate by taking away the sympathetic and allowing the acetylcholine than to act by being there and sympathetic not being there, but we can lower the contractile force of the heart. So less blood is pumped into the aorta and pulmonary trunk. And in addition, what we'll see when we actually get to the blood pressure lecture, guess what innervates peripheral arterials? Sympathetic, going out with the, not the accelerator nerves, but still sympathetic fibers going out with the ventral rami. And they will have less impulses and release less norepinephrine and peripheral arterial will dilate and pressure drops. Obviously, if pressure needs to be increased, then the opposite occurs. And the heart contracts faster, stronger, peripheral blood vessels constrict. So it's primarily the sympathetic nervous system that's going to be in effect and affected by these. All right, so let's look at Let's look at the conduction system. We've been talking about these areas of autorhythmic cells. All right, so now let's see their sequence in contraction. So these are described on page 40 of your lecture notes and illustrated on page 38. <coughs> So we'll go through the basic ECG, talk about what changes 
what pathologies will cause changes, and then we'll stop with that. On Thursday, we're going to put together the cardiac cycle, which is the sequence of atria, ventricular contraction, and relaxation. Atrial contraction, <coughs> ventricular contraction, and relaxation. And put that together with an ECG and the pressure changes. So nothing new. Those events you'll already know. All right, we're just kind of blending them together. So at the base of the superior vena cava, Draw a heart here. So at the base of the superior vena cava, we have a cluster of autorhythmic cells <coughs> identified as the sinoatrial node. Shortcut is SA node. But as you know already, you have to write everything out. Okay? Obviously, when I'm reading, correcting things on the lecture exams, I don't do that. So when I was correcting the fill-ins, you know, you put FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, it was supposed to be luteinizing hormone, I just wrote LH. So I'm not following my own rules there, but when I have 60 to go through, it takes too much time to write that out. So I do use the abbreviations, but I want you to know the full term. So this is identified as sinoatrial node. All right, it's known as the pacemaker of the heart, and that's because it depolarizes usually the most rapidly. So it sets the pace of the heart rate for the rest of the autorhythmic structures leading down from that. Now, this diagram is showing we do have some internodal pathways that I'm not going to go into or require you to know. So those are channels of autorhythmic cells that spread throughout the atria. But this is a fact that we have the gap junctions, going from atrial contractile cell to atrial contractile cell. So that's what I'm illustrating here by the dotted lines. So atrial contractile cells on both atria, left and right, are going to be triggered in a wave from the SA node toward the atrioventricular nodes as they receive this current, respond by creating their own action potentials and sending the current through gap junctions to successive cells, the atria will contract, okay? As we observe that happening, and I did leave myself in the room again, when the heart is at rest, the ECG which, by the way, is a comparison of current changes in the heart to electrical uh, current in the skin. It's not a measure of a membrane potential, all right? So we're not seeing elevations, depolarization, and decreases repolarization. That doesn't apply. It's a comparison. So when the heart is at rest, we see a flat line. It's not a resting membrane potential because we're not measuring the current of a particular cell. It's just showing there's no ongoing change between the electrical activity of the heart and the electrical activity of the skin. When the SA node fires and this current travels through the atria, that creates a blip known as a P wave. So this is caused by atrial depolarization. When the atria depolarize, that shows up on an ECG machine as a P wave. That's not atrial contraction. Atrial contraction will occur as a result, but it's not atrial contraction causing that wave, okay? It's the difference between what's occurring in the heart and the skin. Now, if we were to allow this current to continue to travel through the ventricular muscle, what problem would we create? Would it just squeeze the blood back into the atrium? Well, it squeeze the blood towards the bottom of the heart for which there is no outlet. We don't have any vessels leaving from the bottom of the heart. Okay, remember in the heart embryology, two vessels fused together and came out the top of the heart. So we have to redirect this current to the bottom and have it go up. 
So we have to block it. And we do that by the presence of connective tissue in the valve. This is known as the cardiac skeleton. It's not bone or cartilage. It's just dense, irregular connective tissue. That is non-conductive, but I don't want to write that close to my ECG. So it effectively blocks any further conductance of those action potentials. However, it does get to a cluster of autorhythmic cells here near the base of the atrial septum called the atrial ventricular node. It's about 100 times a minute without influence from the parasympathetic. Atrial ventricular is going to beat around 60, 40 to 60 beats. Okay. And it's activated by the SA node. So it's, it's, if the SA node fires 100 times, the AV node will fire 100 times. The 60 is if the SA node isn't working, left on its own these cells will depolarize at a slower rate. But if the SA node is fire, that faster, that's what we mean by pacemaker. If the SA node is faster, then the AV node will depolarize at the same rate as the information and signals and current it's getting from the SA node. Now, we have a bundle of autorhythmic cells passing through the atrial septum to the interventricular septum. And this is known as the atrioventricular bundle. And those are what again? More autorhythmic cells. And that would be this structure right here. Uh, actually, right here. The yellow. And in the interventricular septum, it separates and forms a bundle going to the right ventricle and a bundle going to the left. And so these are identified as the bundle branches. And those are located in the interventricular septum. The right and left bundle branches. I think on the smaller heart models, those are So you can see them along the side here, like as the bundle branches. Once they get, so they're going to bring the current down the atrial septum, down the interventricular septum, and they will then form additional branches to travel up the external wall and send branches to the ventricular contractile cells. And these are known as conduction myofibers. Or the old name, often still used, are Purkinje fibers. In addition, on the right side, we see a moderator band, all right? Only in the right ventricle. It comes over to one of the papillary muscles. In some of the sheet parts, it's quite thick. In others, it's very thin. So you'll be able to see it today. All right, so the heart's at rest. The SA node fires. The current is carried through atrial contractile cells and creates our key wave. We look at an ECG, there's another activity where we don't see any change in electrical activity. And then 
we see the QRS wave. And this QRS wave is ventricular depolarization. What's happening between the P and the Q, or the P and the R? What's known as the PQ interval or the PR interval. Based on the diagram on the screen or on the board. Pardon? Not quite. There's actually, there's actually a current going through, but it's not being picked up because it's not the muscle cells that are depolarizing. It's the autorhythmic cells. So between the P, the P is the SA node firing and going through the atria. The QRS is the ventricle muscle cell firing. How does that current get to the ventricular muscle cells? Through the bundle branches? It has to go through the AV bundle, down the bundle branches, and up the conduction myofibers. So the time it takes for all of that to occur is what's happening in our PQ or PR interval. As soon as the first ventricular muscle contractile cells start to depolarize, we see the beginning of our QRS. All right. Also during the QRS, masking that change is when the atria are repolarizing. They don't cause the QRS, that's ventricular depolarization, but they're occurring at that time. So we don't have another blip for atrial repolarization, but we do have another blip for ventricular repolarization. So the ventricles are going to be relaxing as ventricular repolarization occurs in there. So when you come back to class on Thursday, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to finish that up here, this diagram right here. It looks a little scary. You will have this diagram on the lecture exam. You don't have to diagram it, but it will not be labeled. You don't have to understand what it means. So, as a little bit of a preview before we look at, sam at samples of ECGs, and let me explain this to you so you don't get hyperventilated before you come to class on Thursday. Up at the top is an ECG. Kind of stretched out so we have time to put everything in. Hearts at rest. Okay, right here between the T wave and the P wave. Both the atria and the ventricles are relaxing. What are the autorhythmic cells doing here? Are they having an action potential or are they depolarizing with their graded potential? They're either doing one or the other, right? So what's going on between the T and the P as far as the autorhythmic cells are concerned? Not repolarizing, repolarizing, they're depolarizing. So the leaky sodium channels, as soon as the P wave is over, actually before it's quite over, we're already at the end of our action potential. Remember we're talking autorhythmic cells, not ventricular cells. So the autorhythmic cells fire, that's what causes the P wave to begin. P wave is depolarization in the ventricular muscle, I mean the, uh, the atrial muscle cell. What's causing that is the autorhythmic cells having reached its action potential. So the action potential is reached right here. When is the next action potential going to occur? Just before the atrial muscle cells contract. Does that make sense? Because every time the autorhythmic cells have an action potential, atrial muscle cells contract. And the atrial muscle cells are going to contract after, as a result of their depolarization. And every P wave is atrial depolarization. So from this P wave to this P wave, our atrial autorhythmic cells are depolarizing. Reach threshold, action potential. Depolarize, reach threshold, action potential. So for this entire time, action potentials occur, autorhythmic cell, leaky sodium channels, is depolarizing. Reaches threshold, 
action potential, atrial depolarized, but our autoerbic cells now are depolarizing. So it's every autoerbic action potential is resulting in atrial depolarization. Now, let's say we add some norepinephrine. It's going to take less or more time for our autoerbic cells to depolarize. Less. Less. So these P waves will be closer together. So we'll have a steeper rate than depolarization. Okay, so that's what's behind this ECG. Now our contractile cells for the atria are going to be undergoing their contractile part during that time, all right, contraction and relaxation, whereas ventricular cells are going to contract and then relax. So that plateau, fast voltage gated channels, plateau, repolarization. And then they're going to have a straight line, fast voltage gated uh, sodium channels, slow calcium channels, drop down again. So that's how we would connect that information that we learned today with the ECG. Yes? So P to P is one full contraction. One cycle. Mm -hmm. So here's the atrial contraction. QRS follows the, with the ventricular contraction. They both relax. While they're both relaxed, is our TP state. Okay, this is what we're going to talk about on Thursday. So stuff you already know, it's just how does it fit together. All right. So we're related to our atrial, our autorhythmic, and our contractile cells. What the, what's actually happening in the heart with these events. Now that's the ECG up there. This complicated structure here is looking at pressure changes. <laughs> so this is the aorta. Blood pressure in the aorta ranges on average from 80 to 120. Highest, 120. Lowest, little rubble little, around 80. So the aortic pressure rises and follows with ventricular contraction as blood is being pushed into the aorta. Pressure down here is atrial pressure. It doesn't get very high. All right, because why does an atrial pressure get very high? Is it ever a closed space? No. It's only closed for a short period of time between the atrium and ventricles, but it's never closed and contracting in a closed space. Otherwise, most of the time the AP valves are open and blood is flowing right through them into the ventricles. So notice here's atrial pressure. Ventricle pressure rises slightly, and then the atrium contracts, and we get a little high rise, a little more rise in the ventricles. But the atrial pressure is not changing very much. What changes is Ventricular pressure. Why does ventricular pressure change so much? Why does it change so much more than aortic pressure? Because it has to pump blood into the lungs and then into the heart. Okay, so it has to have the highest pressure. Why does it have to have the lowest pressure as well? The ventricles have to have both the highest pressure and the lowest pressure. So the Notice here it's below atrial. So there won't be back flow. Exactly. Blood from the atria won't flow into the ventricles and ventricular pressure is higher, right? So to get blood from the atrium to flow into the ventricles, the atrial pressure has to be higher. Does it make sense? Yes. Will atrial pressure ever be higher than aortic pressure? And then blood's flowing backwards. All right, so this is what we're going to look at and make sense of on Thursday. It's a logical because this happens and then this happens because. All right. So that's where we're going to tie what you already know. There's no new information in here. It's all the pressure changes of open and closed valves and how that's related to the ECG. All right, so just to give you a preview of that, and then now let's finish up here with just a little bit of introduction to an ECG changes. This is nothing close to what you'll cover if you become a cardiac technician or a nurse that works in a cardiac unit. Okay, you'll take a whole two weeks of classes. All right, so which of the following diagrams illustrates the electrocardiogram produced by an AV nodal block? And saying, this AV node here isn't working. C, here's a P wave, no QRS, and then we get another P wave. What that's saying is the P wave was created by the current depolarizing the atria, and it got to the atrioventricular node, 
but it never went any farther. And finally, it took so long that the SA node fired again and made another P wave, a block. Sometimes it just means that a long time. So here's a long time, here's a short time. Okay, so just there's some problem, some disease with the AV node or part of this um, autorhythmic cell system that's taking a long time for that current to get through. All right, so now some of these QRS waves are upside down from what we normally are used to seeing. That depends on which lead is being met. Typical ECG has 12 leads. I remember trying to help some ECG techs put 12 leads on the new board. There wasn't enough skin air <laughs> to put these adult size electrodes. For <laughs> there are several different pictures. Depends on the degree. What do you have up there? No, these are showing the same thing, but they just have the pure lipids. This is being different. Different um, All right. So with this right here, so the QRS is going you know, the opposite direction. You don't have to differentiate between degrees. All right. We'll get to that in just a moment. But let's go back. Here's a normal, what's called normal sinus rhythm. P wave, QRS, T wave. I've got some ECGs machine set up over there. Um, we'll have time today if you want to do that. It's scheduled for Thursday. Um, so sometimes it takes a while for everybody to get through. So tachycardia is a rate higher than 100 beats per minute by definition. Okay, There could be a great variety of causes. Radicardia, I took the picture out because it was the wrong one, but radicardia is less than 60 beats per minute. So with my husband and my son having a heart rate of 45, 48, technically that's radicardia. Because of their athletic, they have an athletic heart, it's strong enough, it doesn't have to beat, it's not a pathology, okay? But by definition, it's still radicardia. All right, atrial fibrillation, we have QRS waves, but there's no P wave, there's just this kind of electrical noise. That's because individual clusters of atrial cells are depolarizing on their own, but not in a wave sequence, so we don't see a P wave. A person can live with this and never know they have it. Right? Uh, you may have heard radio spots, advertising, uh, public health message, um, Check your heart rate, hold your pulse, and if you have any extra heartbeats, uh, to go in and get it checked. What happens with atrial fib is an irregular heart rate, and you would have a faster apical pulse than a radial pulse. What causes a radial pulse? Apical pulse is you hear the heart beating, pushing the valves closed, all right? Why do you feel a radial pulse or a carotid? Pulse. What's causing that? The pressure of the arteries. As blood is ejected from the ventricle, it goes kind of as a bolus through the artery and causes it to expand, and then the artery relaxes and recoils behind it. So if two ventricle contractions occur close together, there's insufficient time for blood to fill the ventricle before the second beat, and you hear it as a beat because the valves have closed but you don't feel it as a pulse because insufficient volume has been sent through the artery to cause expansion. So you might have four to five beats extra at the heart than you feel at the distal vessels. You would never have more pulse at a distal vessel than you would at the heart. That's impossible to have, okay? So um, usually the, this can cause death indirectly it can lead to um, irregular blood flow in the heart and clot formation, and then a clot can be sent to a coronary artery or to the brain, and that itself would cause the death rather than the AFib, because we're still getting blood through the ventricles. This is ventricular fibrillation. No P wave, but more importantly, no QRS wave. That means no blood pressure. The heart's just kind of quivering. 
and no concerted action pumping any blood out of the heart. So it's just kind of like this. Okay, like it was having a convulsion. And that's not sufficient to create a flow of pressure. Now what happens with defibrillation paddles? Shock. So it's a great amount of electrical current, depolarizing everything. And what should happen is the SA node should recover faster than any other component. It's kind of like a kindergarten te teacher with an unruly classroom blowing a whistle and shocking all the kids into silence so that he or she can actually be heard above the din. Okay? So it's trying to regain control of all these unruly clusters of cells. All right, so with AV nodal block, we can have a complete block where we have, see these two beats right here? And no QRS in between. Or you can have, here we have a short distance, here we have a longer distance between the P wave and the QRS. So it's just a variation on the same thing, whether or not the current actually reaches the ventricular. QRS depolarization is what's causing this right here. So every time there's a P wave, so here's a short time, here's a long time. Okay, here, we have one P wave, another one, and another one before we finally get a QRS. It has to get through eventually or you wouldn't be alive. Okay, so complete block doesn't mean it never gets through, but you have several P waves in which the current did not make it to the ventricle. PVCs would be both a P, a P wave and a QRS wave out of sync. So, boom, boom, boom. Bump, 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 bump. You'd have an extra beat in there, both the P wave and the QRS. And then a, often an MI is signaled by an elevated ST segment. So that's what's being shown here. And then a large P wave is caused often by mitral stenosis. Remember we said that's where the valves don't close properly? And when the left ventricle contracts, the blood is pushed back into the left atria, and that stretches it out. That means it takes longer for the P wave to travel through, and so we get a bigger P wave. And that can show a problem with the atrial wall or atrial tissue. Okay, so just some real basic characteristics. All right, double lecture. So on Thursday, we'll look at the ECG again in relationship to the other events in the heart and kind of tie them together. But today, let's, um, we're going to do the heart dissection. And um, if you wish to get started on the ECGs, you're welcome to do so, but I'll have them back out on Thursday. In addition to the ECG, we have a physio X activity that you can do over the weekend that is using a 10 simulated frog heart, which is chemicals and ions are added to see how they affect this whole process. Right? That's not the extra credit one. There's an extra credit blood pressure lab towards the end after we do blood vessels. So this one is uh, over the weekend is what's required. So while we take a break until five after, um, and I'll go get the hearts and set them up. There are some additional gloves. Um, if you forgot to bring gloves. And we still have some of the old goggles. If you forgot to bring goggles, they're in that big white box in the back that um, you're welcome to use. And we have enough hearts for groups of uh, two to four people. Okay?